everyone. It's wonderful, wonderful to see a full house on a Monday morning. Uh, my name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I, I look after Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic. I am so delighted for a conversation that we're going to have today. What an extraordinary opportunity for me. Uh, this is the first time that we have gathered uh, the chief of uh, the German naval chief, the Norwegian naval chief, and the vice chief from the United States. So I am very much looking forward to this uh, great conversation about not only the today's maritime domain challenges, but how as allies we cooperate together. Nothing could be more important in the backdrop as Secretary Kerry is in Paris forging together a coalition uh, to combat ISIS. So we have a very timely topic and three uh, extraordinary colleagues who can help us understand these co complexities. We have about an hour of great conversation. Each of our colleagues are going to come up and give some overview remarks. And then um, when they've concluded their remarks, I'm going to do a moderated dialogue for a little bit. And then we look forward to welcoming uh, you into our conversation. That gives you some time to ask the really hard questions. And then we will have a brief Q&A at the very end of our conversation. So without further ado, let me begin by introducing uh, Vice Admiral Schimpf, Axel Schimpf, who's the chief of the German Navy. Prior to uh, his, uh, his service as the chief, which he began in October of 2012, he was the chief of, of the German naval staff, uh, as well as the commander of the German naval staff. After Admiral Schimpf uh, gives his remarks, we will turn to Rear Admiral Lyle Saunas, chief of the Royal Norwegian Navy. Uh, and if many of you have been maybe getting some invitations of the glorious frigate uh, is in Baltimore, and he, maybe Admiral Saunas will tell you a little bit about that opportunity. Um, but uh, Admiral Saunas uh, has um, held uh, previous uh, positions as Chief of Naval Operations at the National Joint Headquarters, as well as he is the, has been the commander of the Norwegian Coast Guard uh, until 2014. And then last but not least, we are delighted to welcome the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Michelle Howard, who's had a distinguished career. Uh, most recently, she served as Deputy Commander of the U.S. Fleet Forces Command and as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Operations Plans and strategy. Now she currently serves as the 38th Vice Chair of Naval Operations. I told you you were in store for a great conversation and without further ado, Admiral Schimpf, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome. Yeah, thank you Heather for your kind words of introduction and your warm welcome. I just have to correct a little bit. I started my tour as Chief of the Navy in April 2010. April 2010. All right. 10. 2010, so it's already a long time. You can see it. Oh. I'm a little bit paler. <laughs> yes, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is, of course, a, a real great pleasure and honor for me to be here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies today. Uh, I appreciate uh, this exceptional opportunity to share some thoughts on the challenges of uh, cooperation in the maritime domain with this distinct audience, and I'm looking forward to a real inspiring discussion. Let me start with some brief remarks about the overall political and strategic context from a German perspective. You're all aware that uh, the global financial crisis has had a significant impact on the defense budgets in the Western world. Many armed forces of our allies and partner nations are experiencing major cuts. Navies across Europe are reducing the numbers of their ships, submarines, helicopters, or aircraft significantly, and some even abandon certain capabilities entirely. And also, the German armed forces are currently undergoing a very challenging process of reorientation, including the reorganization of our command and control structures as well as a realignment of our entire military capabilities. And uh, beyond that, we suffer from a very critical demographic development in Germany. And uh, you know, we abandoned our conscription two years ago. That makes the situation for the armed forces even more complicated and challenging. But despite the above mentioned factors and restraints, we are aiming at being better 
prepared for future challenges to our security in a highly dynamic world. Considering our geographical position in the heart of Central Europe, our far-reaching integration in the European Union, and as an integral part of NATO, the underlying principles of German security policy are straightforward. First, we will always act collectively with our partners and in close dialogue with the regional actors as part of the international community, and here in particular, the United Nations. Second, we will always use all available instruments of foreign and security policy, of which the military is only one out of many. Undoubtedly, that requires a high degree of interoperability, not only between multinational military forces, but also with non-military actors. It requires the will to cooperate on the basis of a well-developed mutual trust between all partners and confidence in their respective capabilities. With respect to the 21st century security challenges in the maritime domain, we are committed to maintain credible maritime forces that offer a very broad spectrum of naval capabilities. That is mirrored in the wide range of operational deployments the German Navy has been engaged in over the past decades. Just a couple of examples. NATO's counter-terrorism operation Active Endeavor is one of those operational deployments which has a visible effect on security and stability in the Mediterranean region. And as part of NATO's standing naval groups, the German Navy is in regular support of that mission. And another very successful example of our maritime engagement in the Mediterranean is Operation Unifil off the Lebanese coast. Apart from active maritime surveillance, this mission, I think you know that, is about capacity building. We are supporting the Lebanese Navy in establishing and maintaining a coastal radar network, including the respective training. And this has a significant impact on the security and stability in the eastern Mediterranean region. And, ladies and gentlemen, in light of the situation in neighboring Syria, I think that stabilizing influence had not lost any of its importance. And in that context, we were also a strong supporter of the US, of the, sorry, UN joint mission for the destruction of the Syrian chemical weapons. Not only our contribution with the frigate for the protection of the US ship Cape Ray, but also the opportunity for Finland to embark a boarding team on our frigate underlines the broad mutual and multinational cooperation in this very important mission. And finally, the EU-led Operation Atalanta, together with NATO Operation Open Shield and the International Task Force 151, is probably the most prominent recent example of successful multinational cooperation and coordination in the maritime domain. The number of piracy incidents, I think you all are aware of that, has dramatically declined due to our coordinated international efforts. And in that context, we're also able to improve existing relationships and important links with the Indian Ocean community and even beyond that. And there is common agreement that our maritime operations have been successful in contributing to security in the maritime domain, and they still are. However, ladies and gentlemen, we have to realize that the current operational reality primarily reflects the lower end of our operational capabilities. Without question, today's complex security challenges call for our navies to be capable, trained, and equipped for the full spectrum of possible missions, including the high intensity operations. So I would say from diplomatic to kinetic, that is a wide range. And consequently, together with our allies and partners, we need to have an interest in retaining our unique maritime capabilities. Thus, 
the German Navy is continuously committed to NATO's standing naval groups. We are a reliable contributor to the standing naval forces and apart from deploying units to both standing NATO maritime groups and the standing NATO MCM groups continuously, we also take the lead on a regular basis, even on short notice when necessary. They, the standing naval forces, are not only a very valuable tool to reach out and promote cooperation and interoperability, even more importantly, they provide a capable naval force in support of contingency, readiness, and response. And, ladies and gentlemen, the development in Ukraine bonds NATO even closer. The reassurance measures for the Eastern European allies are, I think, a very strong political message. And the German Navy is contributing to all of NATO's planned activities, including taking command of the standing NATO MCM Group 1, the deployment of a submarine as an additional support to standing NATO Maritime Group 2, and additional maritime patrol aircraft missions in the Baltic area. We do this on a weekly basis. And the message is clear, we want to send. You can count on the German Navy, although it is a very small one. You can count on her as a reliable and capable partner. And in fact, our neighbors in Eastern Europe appreciate that. And credible high-end capability, however, requires constant training and continued development together with trusted partners. And for this matter, we are in a very close and trustful cooperation with the US Navy. The deployment of one of our air defense frigates, it was Hamburg, the deployment of one of our air defense frigates as an integral part of a US carrier strike group, it was the Eisenhower strike group, or the deployment of one of our 212 class submarines to the US East Coast for trials and exercises, I think are very successful examples for a solid and very good and substantial cooperation. But also our significant contribution to this year's exercise Obangem Express in the context of uh, US AFRICOM's program Africa Partnership Station underlines our commitment as a partner to provide credible maritime capabilities. I think, ladies and gentlemen, it's fair to say that despite the vast challenges the German Navy faces as a result of the reorientation of the entire armed forces, it's not only reorientation, it's significantly also downsizing, we are still quite engaged, and we should be. In today's globalized and challenging world, we cannot set the level of maritime ambition too low. Collectively, the alliance as well as through bilateral and multilateral cooperation, we must, we all must retain the ability to conduct the full spectrum of maritime operations. We must rem remain ready to fight at sea and from the sea if and whenever needed. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, uh, admirals, distinguished guests, organizers, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, thank you for inviting me to this uh, excellent uh, panel, and I'm honored to be here together with such uh, nice colleagues. And looking at my fellow panel members here today, it's clear to me that I re represent a small nation and a small Navy voice. So let that be my way into the topic of today. Before starting on my points, let me provide you with some background to better understand where I come from. Norway is a small nation with a population of about 5 million. That's Rhode Island, isn't it? However, it's a maritime and Arctic nation with global maritime interests. I stand before you as the Chief of the Royal Norwegian Navy, Chief of a modern Navy and Coast Guard, situated on the northern fringes of the Eurasian continent with a common border to a major strategic military base complex. Chief of a Navy of an Arctic nation with a vast maritime area of interest and responsibilities, and uh, the area of responsibility is nearly the size of the Mediterranean Ocean, from the North Sea to the Arctic High North. And finally, 
chief of the Navy of a truly maritime nation with global maritime interests. The strategic landscape is shifting both in Asia and in Europe, and we are facing more uncertainties underlining the need for cooperation, commitments, and demands of contingency planning. And this leads to my first point today. Norwegian policy is funded on the principle that the UN Charter and NATO Article 5 of the Washington Treaty is the key to Norwegian security and defense policy. The collective commitments and capabilities that NATO provides are fundamental. However, NATO is far more than a military alliance. It's a transatlantic political community of shared values. The, al and the alliance is based on the fundamental idea that liberal democracies, based on their shared values, have decided that our security is stronger when we corporate, cooperate collectively. The strength of this simple yet fundamental ID was pro proven during the Cold War. However, it also holds true today. In fact, I believe the recent events in Ukraine demonstrate the value of NATO as a political community based on common values. And this year, actually, Norway have been in charge of two out of four NATO standing maritime forces and was the first group that moved into the Baltic when Ukraine was invaded. The global maritime situation is fluent and hard to uh, predict, but it affects all modern states. That leads to my second point I want to make here today. The premise itself of common maritime challenges. While they clearly exist, they also contain a great deal of variation. The global maritime outlook is not the same from Washington DC, from Berlin or from Oslo. We have all different inputs to the equation, different ambitions, different level of resources, different historical background, but we do share common values and the willingness to share the burden of establishing good order at sea. If we are to have an aligned set of goals and we are to operate together effective, effectively, the basis then is to create a common understanding of what's going on. We are doing this today to some extent, but we need to develop this further we need to take a clear responsibility to share approach and to create arenas and meeting places where this can take place in a normal manner. It is, of course, a matter of trust. Operations like the extractions of chemical weapons from Syria, which was led by Denmark and Norway, uh, had support by Chinese, Russia, Germany, UK, US, it was a success. The fight against piracy in the Gulf of Aden is a multinational operation. And even exercises like RIMPEC, as we have been participating in this year, are examples how nations today globally come together and cooperate to build common security. Finally, my last uh, point following the premise of common maritime challenges, and I guess that is because I'm Norwegian, I would like to talk about Arctic. From an Arctic nation, let me use the Arctic challenge as an example. Climate change has opened a new commercial region in the Arctic, and attention with regard to the development of the Arctic is high. From a Norwegian perspective, security tension in the Arctic is very low. Most nations have established their Arctic strategy built on their national interest, and the Arctic Council is leading the political process to meet common maritime challenges. The region lacks surveillance, communication, and maritime capabilities and resources to operate. All nations recognize the need to build new capabilities and infrastructure, and the cost of this is the key factor in today's fiscal environment. The, <clears throat> the question then is how to organize this, how to develop this from a topic of discussion here at the Washington think tank to sound operating capability. In my opinion, the solution would be to broaden the cooperation among the Arctic states and include others with an interest in the Arctic. A comprehensive approach to the challenges in the Arctic implies close cooperation between military forces, coast guards, a number of civilian agencies, as well as other countries in the region. An initiative like the Arctic Coast Guard Forum and other agencies should be established. Again, the answer must be to create arenas and meeting places for the agencies and states involved, and from, the, from this, 
functions develop coordination, cooperation, and common goal for Arctic develop development. So let me return to the small Navy perspective and put out three aspects. First, from my perspective, it is clear that small nations' main contribution to a global maritime situation starts at home. Our ability to keep our maritime house in order is the foundation. This is, however, more than just patrolling our own waters and implies using all maritime resources available to contribute to a safe maritime operating environment on a global scale. This will in particular contribute to better shared situation awareness, since even small nations like Norway can have a global maritime footprint that can provide important insights in areas of interest. Second, ability to meet challenges to get together rests on the ability to operate together. I must say this ability rests to agree on the larger partners in the cooperation. It is their expertise and know-how we all need to tap into to become part of an efficient fighting force. In order to do this, they must be willing to invite us in, share their expertise, and show patience when dealing with us. And finally, we must routinely operate together. Not only meeting up in exercises and standing NATO groups in home waters, I think we need to operate together on a global scale. This may, may sound ambitious coming from a small nation view and uh, with the current constraints in the fiscal environment. However, it affects our national interest. The challenge is then to find opportunities where the smaller navies can meaningful contribute on a global scale and still operate within their means. As it is uh, our navy and our nation's uh, bicentral celebration this year as a constitution and as a navy, let me just end with a little story. Uh, this year, it's been my pleasure to demonstrate what the new modern Navy can do. And we, as I said, we've been leading two out of four NATO standing forces this year. We deployed a frigate to Hawaii, participating in RIMPAC. And we have been part of extraction of the weapons of Syria, the ch chemical weapons of Syria. But in addition to that, my 15 Coast Guard ships have been patrolling up to 84, 30 degrees north in open ocean for the first time in history. And it's just showing that the ice that we all think are there are not there anymore. And, uh, and they've been doing a, a good governance of our resources, protecting our environment, and that's an equal success history. So, but this is not a new thing to, to Norway. Let's move back to 1869. Norway was already then a maritime power with regard to a substantial shipping sector and part of the Swedish king's domain. Then as now, global shipping was commerce and an important player on a global scale, and political interest followed. It was deemed political important to show the Norwegian flag in areas and events where we clearly had interests. Therefore, in September 1869, the Norwegian warship, the North Star, left Norway for an international deployment. She was part of the opening of the Suez Canal in Port Said in Egypt, and went around Africa to South America, visiting important ports as Buenos Aires and Montevideo, which was the big ports that time. And, um, and next she headed to the Caribbean and eastern coast of the United States. And after one year, in 1870, she was treated with a hero's welcome. Military sea power was and still is the international currency of influence. Thank you for your attention. Heather, thank you for the kind introduction for, uh, for all of us. And I also want to thank CSIS for hosting this discussion today, because this is absolutely a critical topic, I think not just for our US Navy, but for our nation. And for me, it's an honor to be here with naval leaders like uh, Admiral Schimpf and Admiral Saunas. And it's uh, more than just the visible relationship. They are, their countries are reliable partners. And but the, these two uh, have provided outstanding leadership to their navies and have personally reached out to me long before this forum in the interest of deepening ties between our, our navies and our country, and I thank you for that. 
So I happen to believe that navies lead the way among services when it comes to collaboration among friends and allies. And I think the sustained relationship amongst our maritime forces and NATO is perhaps the strongest and best examples of this collaboration. And uh, interestingly enough, over the years as I have formed that opinion, I've had it reinforced by others. It was an Army general who once said, it's fascinating to me the way navies can combine at sea uh, with such ease. And he was referring to the counter piracy operations off the Gulf of Aden. He said, I think it would, it's much harder for us as armies to combine ashore and achieve that same level of synergy. And maybe that is because of the uniqueness of the maritime domain, but the similarity of how we have to approach it in, it, in our ability to operate and eventually fight. The relationship between our three navies goes beyond NATO itself. The navies of the United States, Norway, and Germany share robust and deep friendship, rooted in a long history of trusted partnerships in and beyond the European waters. My chief of naval operations, Admiral Greenert, believes in maritime partnerships and cooperation and in the advantage of forging a global network of navies. In a recent proceedings article, he said, as the world becomes more complex and the oceans less secure, we are compelled to strengthen the bonds of international maritime cooperation. And we have seen this again and again with Germany and Norway and along with NATO as a whole. And really, I would say that relationship with NATO is the foundation of this network of navies. Navies have seen the advantages of cooperation since sailors have been going to sea. And is there anything new or different today? And why should we stay focused on this and keep working at it? Well, I'd like to pound on a point that Admiral Sanis made. We have, and there are in this world, countries that stand for freedom and peace. And these countries that stand for freedom and peace face problems of unprecedented scope, complexity, and difficulty. And I think we sometimes forget how important it is, this concept of freedom. And since I've been serving in this Navy, freedom has meant uh, much to our government in guaranteeing freedom. There, my, one of my first events was in the Gulf War. Kuwait had been invaded, their sovereign territory had been invaded, and the people were no longer free. And you think about more recent events, it can be criminal where an individual is kidnapped at sea, has no right to be kidnapped and has a right to be free, or current modern day sovereign incursions. And it is this shared value, I think, amongst the NATO allies and freedom. It doesn't matter the type of our government. It is the shared value that we believe in the UN Charter, have signed up to it. We have this alliance and that freedom is important. And we do have different perspectives, but that makes us stronger. When the uh, destroyer Hamburg came into port in Norfolk, I had a great opportunity to go on board and talk to the crew. And I got into a very lengthy conversation with the XO, Christian. His concept of freedom is more powerful and near than I will ever have. He started life in East Berlin. His parents, escaped with him, and he thought often as a child about what it meant for his grandparents who were on the other side of the wall. And he grew up in a Germany that was eventually reunited. So Christian has a very real sense of what it means to be denied freedom in this modern world, and what a real sense it means to have freedom restored. And so he serves in the German Navy because this concept of freedom has value for him as it does for all people who live in free countries. And that, that commonality of shared values, I agree with Amosanis, is a big part of our strength. From terrorism to piracy, from illegal trafficking in people and products to humanitarian needs in wake of natural disasters, and not to mention cyber today, there's ballistic missile and nuclear threats the challenges to peace and prosperity are truly immense. 
and to successfully confront all these emerging and evolving 21st century challenges, we must confront them together. Very simply put, we are better together. And for those who serve in the global commons of the maritime domain, international cooperation is and always has been a daily way of life. So to illustrate some of the recent what and where of maritime cooperation, I'll offer you a few real world realities. Both Lars and Admiral Schimpf have talked about the Middle East and the dangerous challenge of the Syrian chemical weapons and the combined operations of the Royal Norwegian and German navies along with our partners in Denmark. And without this combined approach, we would not have achieved our strategic objective of destroying this threat to global stability. In the Eastern Men, we have US warships that stand the watch to ensure Europe remains secure from Middle East and ballistic missile threats. And these warships are often accompanied by NATO allies. And while US ships search the skies, NATO ships keep an eye on the horizon, keeping our ships safe from immediate attack. And as we continue to lead the way in the fight against radical terrorism, the value of the carrier was once again shown when President Obama ordered strikes on ISIL last month. The carrier was there and available. In Europe, US and our NATO allies routinely enter and exit the Black Sea in coordination with Turkey. And in insurance, our combined presence there reminds NATO partners like Bulgaria and Romania that we will be there to support them and ensure international waters stay open for business. And off the east and west coast of Africa, combined NATO forces combat piracy and provide training to our African partners on policing local waters. And off the coast of Western Africa and Central and South America, we sail together to fight illicit trafficking. In the Indo-Pacific region, both Norway and Germany recently participated in the biannual Rim of the Pacific exercise, the world's largest maritime military exercise. Our German partners provided exercise partners, and Norway demonstrated a strike missile shot from a frigate. And also in that region, navies from multiple nations worked together to search for the missing Malaysia Airlines flight MH370. This international search and rescue operation was conducted by as many as 43 vessels and 40 aircraft in the South China Sea, Gulf of Thailand, Malacca Strait, Andaman Sea, and Indian Ocean. The magnitude of support for the Malaysian airline search and the co composition of nations and aircraft and ships clearly show that we can form relationships and traditional and non-traditional maritime partners operate together and produce innovative ways to respond to different types of crises. I'd like to talk a little bit about the why of cooperation. How do we strengthen these bonds of cooperation? First, there's the fundamental point of interoperability, which includes people, equipment, data, and then there's the building of confidence and proficiency through regular exercise and operations. Despite all that, Despite sophisticated technology, personal relationships are still the foundation of interoperability. And through opportunities like personnel exchanges, war colleges, and the International Sea Power Symposium, this week in Newport, we can share ideals from each other and figure out what works and what each partner brings to the team and build a common language to enable better and more standardized ways of interaction. Interpersonal relationships with our naval counterparts help to build trust and enduring friendships that prove invaluable during times of crisis. And indeed, sometimes are the only conduit for which information can be shared. And it was a Chinese diplomat who once said, who once told me as we reached out uh, to uh, our Chinese counterparts uh, in the Navy, there are times when Military people can talk when diplomats cannot. It is the knowledge that we have friends and allies that we can call for help that allows us literally to weather storms and find safe harbor. So we must continue to improve the interoperability of our equipment as data, of equipment and data as well. And this includes working at planning, coordination, communication, 
and leveraging partnerships to reduce capability gaps. The only way we'll get better at the interoperability of our people, equipment, and data is through the rich opportunities provided by consistent combined exercises and operations. And this is illustrated, for example, by the German destroyer Hamburg deploying with the USS Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group in support of operations in the Mediterranean Sea and Persian Gulf. Achieving our shared objectives depends on maritime cooperation. Germany and Norway exemplify the kind of reliable, capable partner that serves as the bedrock of global network of navies. And as we work together to facilitate interoperability and build trust, and as, a, as we all continue to recognize both the value and necessity of working together, we all become stronger. And we will all stand ready to answer the call to fight and defeat, and defeat challenges to freedom and security in the 21st century and beyond. Thank you. Admiral Howard, Admiral Saldanasam, Admiral Shim, thank you. That was really a, a rich discussion. There were so many things to, to pull from. It's going to be hard to uh, restrain myself. I have many questions, but I want to also uh, welcome our audience. I do want to remind everyone that this is an on-the-record conversation. Um, after I throw out a couple of uh, questions to our panelists, I'd invite you. We'll have microphones to pass around. If you could keep your comments very short and your question crisp, that will help us pull in a couple of questions and then uh, give an opportunity for our panelists to uh, to provide some some answers. I There were so many issues uh, and, and uh, really, really important statements came out of it. I think, Admiral Schimpf, your, your comment on, on don't set the vision too low. Even in, in times of austerity, of when budgets are under strain, uh, militaries are transforming, uh, that it's, it's important not to set our vision too low. And I think, Admiral Howard, you're, you're saying that we can combine with ease and the power at which, and I think it's not a well-known story, the Syria, uh, Syrian chemical weapons um, removal, how collaborative that was with partners that we may not normally collaborate with. Uh, and then, of course, the Gulf of Aden operation continues to be a success. And we know new challenges, the Gulf of Guinea and others will, will present us, that this is, this is very powerful, as well as NATO's partnership relationship and, and the UNIFIL example of the, the building partner capacity, so very critical. So I, I thank you again for those, those really important comments. Uh, a question that I have to each of you um, is what is your greatest challenge in your position? Is it budget? Is it political, uh, political will and, and speaking to security policy makers that uh, perhaps are, are reluctant to, uh, to not set that vision too low? Is it just the complexity of the crises? Uh, it seems in every region you're being more and more in demand and sometimes resources are constrained. So I, I leave you with, with that question for each. And then I'd like to pull out for each of you the question that you each tackled, and that is really what are the maritime challenges uh, present and future that may stem from the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. Black Sea was mentioned, I think Admiral Howard, I think this is an important uh, issue. There is quite a bit of NATO naval presence uh, in the Black Sea, and what does that mean, the Baltic Sea? Um, what, is, what is that perspective, and what should we be looking for? And then Admiral Salinas, and your comment on the Arctic, we are starting to see a lot of pronouncements by the Russian leaders about the Arctic and, and enhancing their military modernization uh, along the Northern Sea Route. Does that have any troubling signs for us? What should we um, think about that? And then finally, I'd love your thoughts. You, you talked, each of you, about uh, the Pacific Rim exercises, RIMPAC, where we had a, a German observer in that exercise, a Norwegian frigate, and a, a really important major exercise in a, in a region that we know freedom of navigation is so vital. So I, any additional thoughts you'd like to add? So with that, uh, Admiral Schimp, I think we'll just move down the line, and then we'll turn over the last questions to our audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. And uh, of course, you asked me earlier what uh, 
makes me keep awake That's overnight. Right. And uh, uh, what is it? I slept a... like a baby, so I wasn't <laughs> going to ask. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, uh, there are some big challenges, but uh, I have to be very honest. It's for the moment not uh, the political situation. It's uh, the personnel in the German Navy, because after having abandoned our conscription uh, almost overnight, uh, the situation was extremely difficult to get young people, and the demographic uh, development in Germany is also difficult. So uh, there are no young people on the market which are ready to join the armed forces, and uh, the unemployment rate is very low in Germany, and that traditionally brings a lot of people in industry and not to the armed forces. But uh, we are on a good way, and I think so far it really worked that we could, with the right approach to prioritization, could really support all the important missions where we, in an international uh, cooperative approach, we are being asked for. And that is a good news, and I, I think I pointed it out a little bit during my, uh, my little speech. So, uh, uh, the, of course, in Germany, the politicians, I think that's everywhere the same, but uh, in Germany it's even stronger than everywhere else. The politicians decide the parliament has to get approval for missions where the armed forces will join. And uh, I think over the past months, wherever there was a need to react also on the crisis in Ukraine, it went very smooth and uh, so we could join. Uh, Ukraine, it was the Syria chemical weapon program. So there was a lot of uh, challenges where we could respond on short notice despite the critical situation we are in. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the key to success is not only to have own capabilities, but to have solid, uh, solid ways for a, a cooperative, credible cooperative solutions. And uh, I think that works, and uh, you raised uh, the issue of RIMPEC. Uh, I think it's important not for us, for all of us, uh, uh, not only to stress or to put a special focus on the transatlantic link, but also to uh, uh, send a signal that global scale cooperation is the key to success. And yes, so far we were just uh, participating with an observer, but the idea is, of course, someday in the future, depending, of course, on the scarce resources, uh, to be involved maybe with a unit, with a ship. Uh, I think it is important, this outreach, that we just doesn't focus on our home waters and uh, the waters where we operated over the past decades. The challenges are global, and the solutions also have to be global. And uh, I think sharing the same values is a very solid basis. I think it was stressed several times and we are there on a real good way. Thank you very much. Well, um, being uh, in, in the role of a force provider at the moment, I, I also sleep very well at night. Mm -hmm. But um, I think uh, readiness of forces uh, is, a, is a key uh, at the moment with the strategic shift we have had. Uh, we've been fortunate to have forces ready to support operations. Uh, but I must say that um, to keep a threshold against military aggression, uh, small nations need to come together with bigger nations to have a better readiness together to avoid military escalation. And this also will um, increase our quality as a warfighting force, and it's necessary. So I think that is uh, what are foremost on my thought at the moment. Uh, with regard to the Arctic, um, I'll, I'll come back to that by the end. But I think what we see now, what's the reason why Norway is going to RIMPAC, is, is that Norway used to be uh, a nation heavily supported by all NATO nations because we had this geostrategic uh, position on the northern flank of NATO. So most navies know Norway, and Norway the Norwegian Navy doesn't know anywhere else to be. So, so, so I think the, with the new um, Navy that we have created, which is highly uh, interoperable with the US Navy, um, it's, a, it's a political policy change that we would like to show that we will support our, our allied, uh, allied nations, even though they are big as US. And it's in our national interest uh, to uh, meet the common uh, challenges on a global scale as I, I was talking about. So that was the main reason for sending a frigate to RIMPAC. The other was to demonstrate our, our of course, our 
uh, new strike missile, <laughs> uh, naval strike missile, and, uh, and promote our, uh, a very good uh, and high quality military industry. I'm honest. <laughs> and um, and, and uh, to, to work with a lot of nations like we can do in RIMPAC is, is a challenge, and a good challenge for our sailors and commanding officers to meet, and they learn a lot from that. So it's, it's, uh, it's a gain on, on so many levels to us to do s such a thing. So I'm, I'm really glad we can do it, and I hope to do it again. Arctic. Uh, all the Arctic nations have agreed that the Sea of the Law uh, Convention will be the foundation for developing the Arctic. And, but, you know, the strategic shift here is that what you see in the um, South Ch China Sea, um, nations start to bend uh, the convention to their favor. Uh, does size matter uh, in these uh, things? And yes, some nations think so. We smaller nations think no. We think that there is a law and we should follow that. So that is, um, that is something that uh, I can be worried about uh, with regard to the military complex up in the Arctic. Uh, but eventually I think that the Arctic, from my experience up there, is, is if you start to shoot, you won't get the billion investment to explore your oil and gas in 20, 30 years. So I think all Arctic nations are in favor of keeping this as stable as possible uh, to ensure proper investments. At least I hope uh, they are wise enough to do that. Thank you very much. Heather, if I may, I'd like to combine two of the questions in a different way. Uh, so you referred to challenges and then um, you noted Admiral Schimpf said, don't make your vision too low. So let me talk about the Arctic and not making the vision too narrow. And uh, what happened with Cape Ray and how that developed uh, uh, inside the United States government and then with our partners is an example of what happens when the vision is broader and more inclusive. So when you think about the Arctic and how uh, we're predicting it's going to unfold over the next few decades, we have to start with a much broader vision. It is not uh, Department of Defense and the Navy. It's commerce. It's transportation. It's Department of Energy when you look at the potential for uh, the future up there in terms of uh, extraction. And so that vision has to be homeland security. It is our territorial waters. Uh, and that speaks to the Coast Guard, uh, uh, um, activities such as uh, tourism and all those other things that happen. So the vision we have, what is delightful is for one of, one of our times in history, we have an opportunity not to be surprised. The ice is not gonna be melted tomorrow. I'm feeling pretty comfortable with that one. It's probably gonna happen over decades. So we have time to build a vision that's inclusive and broad and looks at all these elements and what do we need to operate up there safely, both in the commercial world uh, and then hopefully never, but uh, in terms of a military response. So it's everything from search and rescue, potentially of energy folks who are up there, tourists who are up there, uh, to potentially search and rescue of military operations that might go up there. And that, there's some fundamentals we can get at now, working inclusively. We have to have better maritime domain awareness up there. And that also speaks to inclusiveness. All of our <coughs> country's militaries are shaped differently. So if I speak to Norway about maritime domain awareness, he says you need to bring the Air Force in on this conversation. If I speak to Australia about maritime domain awareness, they say you need to bring the Air Force in on the conversation. That each of our functionalities are different. Uh, our U.S. Navy will augment Coast Guard for search and rescue, but it's really the Coast Guard that does those functions. But in other navies around the world, it's all in one. The Navy does those functions as well as uh, the warfighting function. So being more inclusive, being uh, broader in the vision and working at it now and setting us, posturing ourselves that way is part of an answer of not being surprised when the ice is all melted. Uh, decades from now. The um, challenges. Uh, 
Nuclear weapons, the existence of nuclear weapons has been around so long that <coughs> it's intrinsic. It's almost as if we don't think about it anymore. Uh, and yet, uh, for the U.S. Navy, and I would say for the U.S. Air Force, strategic deterrence is our number one mission. And that is uh, our number one mission, I would say, also in terms of homeland defense. But our, our forefathers, our founding fathers, when they talked about why we need a Navy, talked about capricious tyrants. Nuclear weapons didn't exist when the Federalist Papers were written and people were arguing. But when you think about a country like North Korea developing nuclear weapons with reach, reach that comes to this country and arguably several countries around the world, and the thought of a capricious tyrant with control of nuclear weapons, that's what should keep you up at night. So it's not the homeland defense piece. It's what do you do with a capricious tyrant who has, who's developing credible power with reach. Uh, and that is worthwhile staying up at night uh, and thinking about. Thank you so much. We're going to have a lightning round uh, of questions, so I'm going to I'm going to just ha hold to three and please make them very quick so we can let our panelists have their concluding thoughts. Oh, we know there's ah, thank you, sorry. I knew there was a question out there. We'll go right there. The microphone is coming to you right there. Thank you. Oh, and please identify yourself and your affiliation. Yes, ma'am. Th thank you. I'm Robbie Harris, a former naval person. Uh, you asked about Ukraine, and, and if I may, if I could broaden that to a a newly assertive Russia. And if I could ask the panel members, in addition to what NATO has committed to do now with respect to a newly assertive uh, Russia, what else, should, what else should NATO do in the maritime domain to react to, to Russian ass assertion of power? Any other question? Not only is this a lightning round, this is a one more very quickly, right here in the middle, please. Thank you. My name is Jean Ning Nguyen from Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Um, I would like to bring back some points that I heard that you want to talk about the global uh, cooperations and the maritime domains. You w would like to talk about the Air Forces with the importance of the carriers and also the share values, share information, and the nuclear threats. So all of that, when you look at the Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific Ocean, especially in the South China Sea, with the potential of the problems with the ADIZ and the potential deep port being built around Hainan and near the Spratly Islands with all the new um, developments of, upon the rocks in, to build into islands by China. Do you think that we should have uh, some cooperations to also set the normal global norms for the Arctic and the whole um, international laws to be honored. And also with that, would Germany and, and Norway think that the U.S. should be at the table for the UNCLOS? Should the U.S. Senate ratify the UNCLOS? Thank you. Oh, Admiral Howard, that one's for you, the ratification. <laughs> I know your answer, but you, we'll just have that as your. That, that's a yes. Yeah. But the, that has been, it's interesting, across decades, uh, I think many administrations position, yes, we should uh, ratify that treaty. And for us, there's very um, realistic and day-to-day -day operational uh, necessity behind being in compliance with, with that treaty. Thanks. Admiral Schampel, uh, so question on Russia, sort of just elaborating a little bit on the maritime challenges uh, uh, that Russia may pose in the future, and then again, any concluding thoughts on uh, uh, South China Sea, the Indo-Pacific region, and the challenges of, of the global commons? And we'll have you all to give your final thoughts. Uh, I think you asked uh, the maritime challenges, what is underway in NATO, and what could be uh, done uh, beyond that. Of course, we touched it, and I touched it in my short presentation, that uh, the package of assurance or reassurance, there is something underway. We uh, activated one of the standing NATO maritime groups. We are underway with our maritime patrol aircraft. Beyond that, of course, uh, we keep a sharp eye on the development in the Russian Navy, which is something very special over the past years. It's really uh, a situation where they 
develop a lot of sophisticated systems to uh, uh, come back on the stage to be a significant player. NATO is underway with uh, some special initiatives which have been discussed on the summit in Wales with this, this uh, defense uh, planning package, you know, that uh, we, we in NATO want to be better prepared with uh, less deficiencies than we have right now. And this defense planning package is, I think, uh, also an interesting signal, not only to Russia, but uh, to all who uh, uh, might uh, challenge uh, the alliance, that we are willing to uh, upgrade our capabilities to uh, get away with deficiencies and to better position to take also short notice, uh, short notice challenges. You know that uh, as part of this uh, readiness action plan, NATO is about to uh, uh, create and introduce a very high readiness uh, action group or a readiness force, uh, which uh, will uh, have a sort of uh, uh, headquarters in, uh, uh, in the multinational core northeast. So there are a lot of uh, activities underway just uh, to position NATO uh, better than before, just to uh, overcome some deficiencies. And otherwise we have just to watch how the situation is going to develop. Uh, that is not really a good answer, but uh, when I look in my crystal ball, I cannot see any more for the moment. So, so. Well, if I could add, add to um, Admiral Schimp's uh, points, what, uh, what I read out of the uh, NATO summit is that both Georgia and Ukraine will still be on the uh, partnership program for integration, and that's a strong political message. Uh, but at the moment, when Ukraine still, uh, there's no peace negotiation that are efficient at the moment. Um, I think in addition to what's said, uh, I know we have a staff officer participating in exercise Seabreeze of Odessa uh, at the moment. And there are some other uh, training and exercise uh, activity uh, involving NATO in the country. But I think the key is, uh, as, uh, as Admiral Shim said, uh, the high readiness force and the reassurance of the Baltic states and other of these former uh, Soviet states um, are important for the stability of the um, region. With regard to your question about Asia and, and whether Norway or Germany uh, are working with the US so they can adopt to the C, uh, C Law of the Sea Convention. I think actually in the US uh, uh, strategic concept for the Arctic, it's stated as one of their goal is to convince Congress to adapt to that. So, and I totally agree with them. Thank you. Um, so Ukraine uh, and Russia is like many other contingencies around the world. There's maritime uh, capacity, navies, do two things for their country. They can assure and they can deter. And one of the reasons they do that is there is a visibility component to both those uh, uh, objectives. Seeing is believing when you're talking about insurance of allies and deterrence. So whether it's in the South China Sea, uh, if, if we stay back stateside and go, we're with you, it's, it's not much in the way of assurance and it's not much in the way of deterrence. And we also have to remember the other component of deterrence is credible power. There has to be strength. So it is, it is that capability forward uh, and the knowledge that the nation is willing to use that capability that can often be a big deterrence factor and is obviously a huge assurance factor. So in, in the end, the best thing we can do as the United States Navy is stay committed to presence, being forward, being a responsive option for whoever the president happens to be. Well, I am assured that we have uh, excellent uh, colleagues uh, that are ensuring our safety and protection, so I can sleep well at night to answer your greatest uh, challenges. Thank you. I'm so pleased that you were able to come here before heading off to Newport for the International Sea Power Symposium. This was such an important conversation. I hope you'll come back, and I thank you. And please join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion. Thank you.